Thank you. Well, this is the uh, special meeting of the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District, September 9th, 2020. Um, would, you, would you call the meeting? Oh, the meeting is uh, going to convene at this time. And Holly, would you please take the roll? Okay. Director Ferris? Here. Director Falls? Here. Director Henry? Here. Director Moran? Present. And President Swan? Here. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Holly. So let's go to the unfinished business. Rick, would you like to lead it off? Sure. Uh, I see we're participants are, are still joining at a, at a pretty good rate. Um, but um, uh, thank you uh, all for, for attending the, the special meeting of the Board of Directors. Uh, this meeting will be to discuss uh, the district's response uh, to the CZU Lightning Complex fire. Um, next slide, please. Uh, our presenters will be uh, myself, I'm Rick Rogers, the district manager. We have uh, for water systems and operations, James Furtado, our director of operations. For water quality, quality, we have Nate Gillespie, our water treatment and system supervisor. Finance and customer service, we have our uh, director of finance and business services, Stephanie Hill. And for outreach and environmental issues, we have uh, Carly Blanchard, our environmental planner. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, some statistics on the CZU Lightning Complex fire started 8-16-2020. Uh, it was a lightning fire. Uh, as of this morning's briefing, uh, 86,509 acres burned in both, I do believe, Santa Cruz County, the majority is Santa Cruz County, and San Mateo County. Uh, the fire is, as of today, is 83% contained. Uh, 1,490 structures were destroyed, one fatality, and at one time there was 2,224 personnel um, fighting this fire. The entire San Lorenzo Valley Water District was evacuated. Uh, next slide. Uh, the Board of Directors has held four emergency meetings uh, to receive system updates, to access conditions, and take action. Uh, cooperation with Cal Fire, emergency water conservation measures, emergency spending to restore water facilities as quickly as possible, and to help facilitate emergency repairs, approve uh, uh, additional temporary staffing, contractors, and engineering consultants. The photo you see uh, is uh, the helicopter we used yesterday um, to move pipe up to uh, one of our, uh, replace for one of our intake lines to get water as quickly as possible back to our surface water treatment plant. First time we had one come in on a trailer. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, fire suppression, uh, the district personnel were in constant contact with firefighters to assist uh, with response. We isolated areas and moved water uh, where firefighters needed it the most and at the time as they needed it the most. Fire hydrants and portable tanks were used for firefighting up and down Highway 9 and corridor and in the side streets. The Highway 9 corridor was maintained fully charged with water pressure for firefighting um, from Felton all the way to North Boulder Creek. Um, so a lot of the side street water mains were isolated from Highway 9 to maintain water supply for firefighting. Next slide. Water connection uh, statistics. Uh, as of today, we have 510 connections with a do not drink, do not boil order. Um, we just increased today our connections, uh, or decreased today our connections without water. Uh, that number shall, will change uh, today to 300 connections are still without water. And water is projected to be restored by September 12th to those remaining 300 connections. Next slide. Areas without water, this slide should been, uh, we'll update tomorrow too. We still have uh, Big Basin Way, which is our biggest area, Big Basin Way from Boulder Brook Drive to Brook Lane, West Park and uh, area. Uh, Blackstone Terrace has been restored. 
Uh, the Upper Ridge Drive Eckley Terrace is still out of water. It's projected September 12th. Sweetwater and Lane, they just started turning the, the valves on uh, in the last hour, and that area is back in water. Uh, upper uh, Alta Via and Monon Way are still out of water. Uh, Blackstone Terrace uh, is back in water. So we've made some, some headway, uh, and we're looking forward to restoring water to, uh, on September 12th. Next slide. Major damage is the raw water supply lines that go to uh, all of our surface sources across the Ben Lomond Mountain. That's Foreman, Peavine, Sweetwater, and Clear Creek. All together, that totals 7.5 miles of raw water supply line uh, that crosses the Ben Lomond Mountain. Um, the fire was hot. We walked that with FEMA representatives. That area has a lot of damage limited access, um, time frame to replace, type of material needs to be discussed. There are a considerable amount of damaged trees. Uh, the trees stumpage and roots are burning underground. And uh, when those stumps burn and they lose their roots, uh, we have several small landslides along the trail. Uh, we have environmental concerns, the cost and constructability. The, the whole 7.5 miles before was installed by hand labor. Uh, that photo you see is some of the support structure uh, that used to have pipe on it that has been burned and destroyed. Uh, next slide, please. Water quality. Um, I'll ask the, the district's uh, water quality and system supervisor, Nate Gillespie, to continue with the presentation. Yeah, thanks, Rick. Um, so water quality. Uh, some of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District service areas were depressurized in the recent fires. Um, and some structures within those depressurized areas have burned. Uh, so when a large portion of the water system depressurizes, it can open up the water distribution system to various types of contamination, uh, including bacteriological contamination, uh, nitrate contamination, and uh, organic chemicals uh, can also enter the system in this depressurization. Next slide, please. Um, so we know from experience with the uh, city of Santa Rosa and the Paradise Fire uh, that a organic contamination, including benzene, can affect fire damaged uh, systems that experience pressure loss. Um, regulatory authorities believe that benzene and other chemicals are created by the burning of plastic pipes, other water system components and structures, and that they can be sucked into the water system when it loses pressure. Next slide, please. So uh, we issued on August 29th a do not drink, do not boil order for a majority of the system uh, or all of the system north of uh, Brookdale. Um, this was done as a precaution to uh, widespread depressurization. Um, this was done in conjunction with our regulatory agency, the State Water Resources Control Board Division of Drinking Water. And it was uh, again issued to all affected areas. Next slide, please. It's like we, there we go. Uh, water quality process. So again, we're consulting with a division of drinking water um, from the State Water Resources Control Board. That's our uh, regulatory agency. Um, the San Lorenzo Valley Water District doesn't get to decide what makes safe water. That's up to the State Water Resources Control Board Division of Drinking Water. So uh, we begun a, a robust sampling plan in conjunction with the uh, State Water Resources Control Board to help identify uh, contaminated areas um, and uh, um, gather water quality data. Next slide, please. Uh, water quality sampling. So we're still collecting uh, samples for uh, bacteria, nitrates, organic chemicals, and other constituents from representative areas of the distribution system. So Rick had mentioned some areas that will be returning to water service shortly. Those areas will still be under the do not drink, do not boil, water advisory, and that's until they can be cleared by the State Water Resources Control Board that their water is absolutely safe to uh, return back to service. Um, so sample results uh, are going to be posted to our website as soon as we are able to go over these sample results with the Division of Drinking Water. Um, I'm happy to say tonight we had posted all of our lab results uh, received uh, as of this morning. So uh, I know that's a a uh, question a lot of people have had uh, about uh, posting the lab results and those are on our website right now. Um, to date, we actually have a, a little over 90 
uh, samples collected. And we've actually, as of this morning, received results on roughly about 50 of those samples. So a little bit more than uh, what's on the slide here. Next slide, please. Um, how long will the do not drink order last? So uh, we have lifted uh, the do not drink, do not boil order in a vast majority of the system um, as we've been sampling this last uh, uh, couple of weeks. Um, but uh, the areas that the do not drink, do not boil advisory is still in effect. We are letting the data guide us. So I cannot give any uh, concrete dates. So we need to sample, wait for the sample data to come back and review that with our State Water Resources Control Board. Um, these aren't single sample uh, events. We have to confirm through multiple sampling uh, dates and locations that uh, we're certain contamination is not um, in existence before uh, we can remove this uh, do not drink, do not boil notice. And all notices are lifted in conjunction with the State Water Resources Control Board Division of Drinking Water. Again, it's not our decision to lift these notices. They must be done in conjunction with our regulatory agency. Next slide. Um, so as of uh, 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 yesterday, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, that would have been uh, Monday, uh, based on water quality slam samples collected over the past week, uh, the Division of Drinking Water did approve the cancellation of the do not drink, do not boil advisory to uh, roughly 2,700 of our customers. But as of today, 510 customers remain under that do not drink, do not boil advisory. Next slide. So uh, this is a, a late breaking development. We did detect benzene in one of our samples uh, in the Riverside Grove neighborhood. Um, so uh, last night, uh, the water district was notified of a preliminary detection of benzene. Uh, at a sample collected on Creek Drive in the Riverside Grove neighborhood. Uh, this sample was taken on uh, September 4th, which would have been last Friday. Um, so parts of this neighborhood are still under the do not drink, do not boil advisory that was issued on 8-29-2020, uh, including where this sample was collected. Uh, the Riverside Grove neighborhood was a neighborhood that was impacted by the CZU uh, Lightning Complex fire quite a bit. Um, there are no HDPE pipes in this neighborhood, but there are plastic service lines to customers' homes that could have melted during the fire and caused benzene contamination. Next slide, please. Uh, the final lab report for the Creek Drive sample that was collected on uh, September 4th showed a detection of 2.7 micrograms per liter or parts per billion of benzene. The state health uh, state health-based maximum contaminant level for benzene in drinking water is one, parts per one part per billion. Um, so immediately after receiving this preliminary uh, detection, uh, the Water District reached out to uh, State Water Resources Control Board Division of Drinking Water uh, to notify them. Um, so this area remains under the do not drink, do not boil advisory. And this morning, the Water District hand-delivered additional notifications to each affected home. Um, and in addition, pallets of bottled water had been placed in the Riverside Grove neighborhood for residents. Uh, next slide. Uh, so samples were also collected at this, uh, this site on uh, September 3rd, September 5th, 6th, and 7th. Uh, lab results for these samples has not yet been received and uh, the Water District will be releasing those lab results as soon as they become available and we've had a chance to review them with our regulatory agency. Um, so uh, the Water District in cooperation with the Division of Drinking Water is planning on conducting an aggressive flushing and sampling regimen over the next few weeks in the affected area. Uh, we wanna gather a lot more data in that neighborhood to see how widespread uh, the contamination is and uh, uh, what quantities we're seeing in that neighborhood of uh, benzene. Um, so the district is moving forward with fire damage inspections of all service lines in the Riverside Grove neighborhood and removing service lines from houses that have been destroyed by fire, which is approximately 40. Next slide, please. So a big question, does the Riverside Grove contamination affect other parts of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District system? Uh, we do not believe it does, no. 
Uh, so this affected area is separated from the rest of the system by a check valve or a one-way valve at our Riverside Grove pump station. So anything below this pump station can't be receiving water from the affected area. Um, but as a precaution in co uh, cooperation with our regulatory agency, we will be collecting samples in the surrounding neighborhoods to ensure that contamination does remain isolated to the affected area. Next slide. Just here's a bit of a snapshot of the uh, uh, fire damage uh, done in uh, uh, Riverside Grove. Right, that was obtained from uh, the County of Santa Cruz. It's their map from planning. Uh, the, red home, uh, the red houses that you see are destroyed. Uh, the green, uh, uh, no damage. The other ones have partial damage. Our tank is up at the top of Pinecrest. It's kind of hard to see, but you can see a, a little round circle by two houses that were destroyed. Uh, it's on my left of the screen on Pinecrest Drive. And the pump station is located uh, right uh, down inside the fire area. But you can see a lot of homes uh, were destroyed by fire. That area was hit, impacted pretty hard. Go ahead, Nick. Next slide, please. The district has been uh, uh, with, in conjunction with the County of Santa Cruz, making bottled water available at our operations building in Boulder Creek. We've gone, uh, I do believe to date, uh, I think over 98 pallets of water handed out to people. We've had a lot of volunteers bringing water. We've had uh, volunteers passing out water. Um, the county has really stepped up in delivery these last few days. We went, we ran out a couple times during the real hot spill. But now as repopulated areas, we're getting people coming from uh, other areas, Big Basin, Forest Springs, um, and we're welcoming them um, all in to uh, get some bottled water. Uh, next slide. Once the uh, do not drink, do not boil order was lifted in downtown Boulder Creek, uh, uh, maintenance staff installed a bottle water filling station for large quantities. Um, uh, this is a four bottle station that can fill uh, uh, five, up to five gallon containers and it's uh, being a big hit. People are, are nonstop coming up to that and, and filling larger containers uh, for, uh, for their use. Uh, next slide. Damage. About uh, 7.5 miles of the district's raw water supply lines were destroyed. Uh, pipe sizes are anywhere from six to 12 inch. Uh, the treatment plant was shut down before the fire reached supply lines to protect the treatment plant from contamination. We did have uh, heat maps uh, from our, uh, our fire consultant, uh, uh, Panorama, that uh, were satellite heat maps and we were able to track uh, the fire and the director of operations and our water treatment supervisor made the determination to turn uh, the treatment plant offline about two days before the fire reached our supply lines. And so that saved us a lot of damage uh, to our treatment facility. Currently water is being supplied pumped from groundwater wells and through the uh, inner tie six with the Felton water system, the district's Felton water system, uh, supplying some surface water from uh, Fall Creek. Uh, with that picture you see is the actual pipe on fire. Uh, next slide. Over 50% of the district's water storage is located in Boulder Creek uh, at the Lion Surface Water Treatment Plant. Uh, well, tr transmission water mains between the large tanks uh, were destroyed by fire, uh, draining uh, the tanks in a very short while. Uh, construction crews are in the process of installing new piping uh, and to the tanks and scheduled to be back in service by September 12th. Again, as Nate says, uh, once we fill those tanks with water, we have a 72 hour hold period before we can start our sampling to determine if we have any contamination. So it's just not filling the, uh, the tanks. It's uh, a, a big sampling um, project and it's very time consuming to ensure the water is potable. We will get our folks back in water, but they will be under, continue to be under the do not drink. Uh, not only were, wa were raw water supply lines destroyed, um, the operational uh, turbidity monitoring station and pressure centralizing chamber 
it's that big concrete structure you see in that picture, uh, was destroyed by fire. That's the Pormon Creek intake right up uh, uh, at the stream. Next slide. Uh, repairs are underway with material uh, procurement. It was slow in the beginning, but now material has been arriving continuously. Several areas require the replacement of water tanks due to fire damage. And you have to see three 10,000 gallon tanks coming into town there into Boulder Creek on their way to Blackstone and Eckley. Next slide. Repairs are difficult on these smaller zones due to the steep uh, topography and the lack of access. Uh, the fire impacts uh, damage these tanks. Uh, we are on the high reaches to, main, to maintain gravity of flow to homes. Um, fire did burn down the Benelowen Mountain, reaching several of our facilities. Uh, you're, you're looking at here is the Blackstone tanks being craned in uh, up on top of that sandstone ridge. Uh, and the only access to get to that is to shimmy up that pipe like that gentleman's doing. Uh, next slide. Uh, damage summary, uh, 7.5 miles of the raw water supply line. Treated water lines between the three major tanks up at the uh, Lion Tank, Foreman Creek Turbidity Station and Pressure Reducing Station, the Riverside Grove Tank uh, and Booster PG&E drops and SCADA control, the Bull Spring raw water line, um, a high reaches of the, the spring line was damaged up on Empire Grade. Uh, south Reservoir piping from the tanks to the booster pump, 2,500 millennial feet. Temporary main has been reinstalled and that's the system that they're uh, energizing tonight with water. Alta Via and Monon Way transmission mains, uh, the Eckley tank, booster pump, transmission mains, SCADA control, PG&E drop, all, all facilities were lost in that zone. Uh, Blackstone tank with associated plumbing, uh, the Bull Spring, uh, Raw water supply line, I mentioned that twice. Uh, Foreman, Peavine, Sweetwater, and Clear, Clear Creek intakes. Uh, and we're finding uh, several services damaged and there are uh, more damage we're finding as we are out in the system, pulling it back up online. I do want to make a correction to that slide. Um, neither one of those Bull Creek raw water supply lines is right. It is, Bull, it is Bennett Spring raw okay. water supply line. Um, Bull Spring raw, raw water was not affected. Did we get a chance to look at Bull Spring? Yes, and nothing was affected there. Okay. Must take. Other damage, uh, roughly 200 water meters. We lost some, some small equipment. And what you're seeing in that photo is in order to get in and do the piping replacement between the three reservoirs up in uh, the water treatment plant, several trees had to be removed that have burn damage. We had a registered professional forester come in and assess the trees and he selected many trees in that area that are damaged and need to come out. So that slowed down the response to replace that plumbing, but um, for safety and for ongoing protection of those facilities, uh, these trees uh, need to be removed. And I do believe James, you're working on with one of the local mills to see if there's a salvage value. Yes, that's correct. We're working with uh, two different mills now. We have a private mill as well that came uh, came to us and asked to buy the wood as well. So uh, the forester, Steve Butler and Bob Pilgrim, Travis Tree are both scaling and working with both of them to figure out what our best resource is to get rid of the trees. Thank you. Uh, right now they're being stored on the Prosser property. Um, we hope to get them out of there shortly. Uh, next slide. Uh, James, you want to take these? The director of operations? Yes, yeah, so this is a rough schedule and assessment of the damage and everything out there. And we have Sandus Engineering working on this with us. And he started putting together their schedule. Um, this has been updated today. This is very rough what you're seeing now. Um, a lot of the thing a lot of the stuff on here was compiled today and updated today. We were not able to get that back from them to put that into this slide. But these are the main projects that we have going right now and the progress that we're making. The progress is kind of rough. Like I said, it was updated today. We would like, we'll, when we get the updated one back, we will be posting it and getting it out so that everybody can see what's going on. Um, but the, 
there's three pages of this, so you can go ahead and flip through each one of these, and you'll see that. Um, it's kind of hard to see. It's small. Form into Lion Pipeline, that is being worked on at this time. Lion Tanks to Big Steel and Big Steel Booster, we are working on that as we speak. Big Steel Tank Piping is also being worked on. Uh, Big Steel Booster Power and SCADA is Cupertino Electric, and they are working there. Next slide, please. And then you move over to Alta Via Mon and Way. That is 100% complete and back in. The line is in, but we have that isolated from the system as that is part of one of the zones that was opened. So we will not be able to put that into service until we are cleared by the state of VOCs and lifted from the do not drink, do not boil. So what we'll be doing there is we will be flushing that main and then testing it daily and getting those results back until we can get lifted from the state. So those people will be out of water until the state lifts the do not drink, do not boil. Even though there's water there, they will not be in water, pressurized water. Uh, Bennett Springs Raw Water Line, uh, that is actually went into progress today. They actually got the whole thing fused and dropped into service today. And we are starting to put that back into service. They are on a do not drink, do not boil. It is a raw water system, so that was put right into service. Uh, Pine Drive water line was taken out by a dozer during the fire. And when that was taken out by the dozer, our crews went right in and fixed that. And that was about 40 feet of main line that we were able to cut out lower into the road so that it wasn't on surface level and replace that and put it back into service. And testing was done and everything came back clear. Next slide, please. Uh, so you got South Reservoir, that's the one down from Clear Creek and it goes up to Sweetwater Lane up off of Alba Road. Um, all that plumbing has been put back into place. The tanks are being filled as we speak. We chlorinated the tanks, then drained them. And then now we are refilling that system. They are on the do not drink, do not boil order notice. And we will be beginning testing on that tomorrow for VOCs, back tees, and everything else that the state wants. They will not come off of that until they are lifted by the state, but they will be in water. Um, I can't read that next. Oh, Cool Creek intake and piping, no, no start on that yet. That will come after the foreman intake line. Um, that's a little bit later down the road. Riverside Grove tank, that's a power drop there at Riverside Grove tank. And as we did mention, there was a benzene, benzene hit in that area. Um, as the customer service lines and their service lines from the meter to their houses were PVC and our lines are poly. And that system did depressurize. And so we had some siphon into that system. And so that is pretty much the cause of the benzene hits out there. We started a bunch of flushing out there today, flushing of the system. And uh, the maintenance crew is beginning to go out there and remove all service lines back to the main from the burned homes. Once the burned homes come back in to begin rebuilding or whatever they end up doing, we will work with those customers to relocate their service lines and relocate their meters. As that area had a very wooded area and a lot of those meters were in bad locations already as it was. So with the new construction, we hope to clean up that system quite a bit. Um, and then we have a little bit of damage on the booster pump station as well. The uh, power meter melted, but we're able to run that booster pump station by generator. So we are running water, which is a good thing. And we are working with Cupertino Electric on a new meter. And we have a little bit of fascia work and roofing work that has to be done there. The fascia burned on one side and the roof is a little charred on top. So we'll be changing that out to a fire resistant roofing. Um, Eckley tank and piping, we got everything out of there. All the piping is back down to the booster pump station. A new tank has been put back up on the hill. Uh, Cupertino Electric is coming in to re re redo all the power there. That system there cannot get water until the lion pressure zone is back in water as that feeds the Eckley pressure zone. So we will not be back in water there until we get water up to Big Steel, then to Little Line, and then it goes to Eckley. 
it's a whole ladder of events that will have to happen for them to become back in water. Next slide, please. And we got Blackstone tank and piping. That's all been done by district staff. You've seen on the crane lift, we put new tanks up there. We did all the piping that was damaged. Um, we have been testing there, if I'm correct, Nate. And I do believe we have had no hits in that neighborhood. Just to interject, we have not had any results come in for Blackstone okay. yet. Okay, so we, so we have been testing, but we have no results. Okay, correct. that's good. Thank you for the clarification. So, but everything has been replaced and we are up and running. Those people are in water, but they are on the do not drink, do not boil. And then the rest of those five projects down below, um, except for the Riverside Grove booster one that I talked about, the rest of them are gonna take a long process to fix, even to put in temporary piping or whatever and we end up doing if we go permanent or what not. So we need to get FEMA out and do a lot more investigation and inspection on those systems in order to figure out how to move forward. All right, next slide, please. Um, to date, here's our recovery replacement cost. We had our first FEMA assessment. Uh, two teams came in, uh, FEMA and Office of, and State OES uh, representing the state of California and FEMA representing the feds. Um, this was our, our preliminary assessment uh, for uh, recovery and replacement costs for the various projects. Uh, some things we don't have good numbers yet, such as the watershed, the 1,620 acres, what we're going to do with the damaged trees, uh, uh, landslide protection, so forth. Um, we're still assessing that, uh, but you can see that the, the bulk of uh, the cost, the heavy costs are the uh, raw water supply lines. Those are going to be very expensive uh, to replace once we figure out and uh, we engineer and uh, we do a, an evaluation of what's available to the district. Next slide, please. We'll have the watershed and we'll ask, I'll ask uh, our environmental planner, Carly, to uh, do an update on the watershed. Great. Hello, everyone. So um, as mentioned earlier in the presentation by Rick, we did have pretty heavy fire damage on the Ben Lomond mountainside. Um, out there, we own about 1,600 acres, um, which houses our intakes and the five mile raw line that was burned. Uh, last week on Thursday, we took out CAL FIRE's emergency response team, who's going to put together a report on the area, calling out the water district specifically. This is really good news for us um, as far as funding. Um, this will be brought to the county directly, and then the county will be forming a group of multiple agencies, including the district, and we'll be able to hopefully get funding for erosion control and watershed restoration. Um, right now, uh, our consultant, Panorama, who was working on our fire management plan that was in draft form um, and supposed to be released in September, um, has shifted gears and started to work on post management of fire damage. Um, so in the final management plan, a lot of post fire recovery will be included now, um, which was not going to be previously included. We also Prior to the fire, we're working on a CAL FIRE CFIP grant um, to begin implementation of defensible space. And um, unfortunately, that, that wasn't able to happen. So we're going to shift gears on that as well and establish a forest management plan with the CFIP grant. Um, and that CFIP grant will cover 90% of the establishment of a forest management plan, which we can then use for future implementation for uh, forest management and restoration. It sounds like according to the county, we'll be receiving the uh, CAL FIRE WART report this week. And once that is received, we'll be able to start those meetings with the county and the state level and hopefully begin figuring out funding and the next steps for erosion control. So, Rick, you're, you're muted. Uh, next slide. 
As you can see, uh, as we talked about, our surface water supply uh, has been impacted. Approximately 50% of the, of the district's water supply is surface water. Uh, when summer stream flows drop off, well water is used to supplement uh, water supply. In winter, the wells are shut down, allowing for recharge. It's very important to the district that we allow water, our, our wells to uh, recharge, uh, and recharge the aquifers. Emergency restoration is already underway on the Foreman Creek surface water line and intake. Uh, the photo you saw was yesterday um, moving pipe up to uh, the treatment plant. Those are 40 foot sticks of 12 inch pipe uh, moving up to the treatment plant to start to restore that pipeline for uh, to bring water into the uh, surface water treatment plant. Next slide. Uh, for the finance section, our uh, Stephanie Hill, our Director of Finance and Business Services, will give you this presentation. Uh, from the finance perspective, not, not much has changed from the last special board meeting. Um, we still have, you know, roughly $3 million in reserve to help finance this stuff. Um, but that money goes through very quickly. That helicopter uh, was about a little over 60 grand in the blink of an eye. Um, we will be working with FEMA and Cal OES for the emergency funding. Um, you do need to pay up front typically, and then you get reimbursed. So we will be working with some financial institutions to get a bridge loan uh, for whatever amount, you know, is determined that we're going to need uh, to bridge the amount until we can get the FEMA reimbursement. Good news is interest rates are still at historic lows. So, you know, from, from that perspective, it, it is a, okay time to be borrowing money. Um, we'll still be working with the insurance companies for any facility needs. Um, it's still unknown at this point if any recovery rates will be needed. Next slide. Customer service. Um, if you're concerned that if your home's in a do not drink, do not boil area but need confirmation, you can still go ahead and contact customer service with your address. Uh, late fees have been suspended at least through the month of September. The district has a policy for if your home was destroyed that suspends billing for up to three years. Uh, we have about 120 homes believed to have been destroyed within our district. Given the extreme circumstances, the accounts are being reviewed to potentially be written off against some of the surplus funds from the fiscal year, um, this fiscal year 2021 rate assistance program. Uh, in addition, we have pulled them out of the this upcoming billing period um, to allow for us to get some of this stuff sorted out. Customers will continue to receive regular bills. The 9-5 billing was delayed, but is scheduled to go out tomorrow. Um, the delay mainly was we were in the middle of reading a lot of these different areas um, w when the fires did break out. Uh, we still do have a high volume of mail coming in, so payments are being processed daily. Um, we are, quote unquote, caught up um, every day, but I think we are still getting a lot of the mail that was previously sent getting sorted out and, and brought to us. So we're trying to get people's payments applied to their accounts as quickly as possible. Next slide. Questions, before we, before we go into questions, Nate, are you prepared to say what we posted today? We posted a, a great deal of information on our website in regards to water quality. Um, are you uh, are, are you prepared to give a quick summary of what was posted that might cut back some of the questions? Uh, yeah. Yeah. No problem. Um, so yeah, we, we did post uh, all uh, VOC lab reports uh, um, that we have received up until this morning. Um, so we've been sampling a lot over the, uh, the last uh, couple of weeks. So we've got results of over 50 samples there. So we have the lab results in a uh, kind of a, a little more summary of a format. Uh, it's, it's basically an Excel spreadsheet uh, broken up by sample location and uh, um, sample results. And then we also have the uh, hard copy lab, uh, lab results that, uh, you know, it's roughly about uh, 500 pages worth of uh, raw lab data from uh, our contract lab. 
Um, included with that is uh, also just kind of a summary of any um, you know, remarkable results. And um, uh, that's all, again, on the, the district's website. Thank you. With that, I'll turn it back over to the chair for questions. Thank you, Rick, and thank you and the staff for such a complete and comprehensive update. It's very, uh, very excellent. Uh, so let's first see if the board has any specific questions they'd like to ask before we go to the public. So if any of the board members have a question, raise your hand and we will bring you right up. Okay, Director Fultz, unmute yourself. Yeah, thanks. I just want to start out by saying I think it was phenomenal that our district staff was right on the spot with respect to isolating and shutting down as much of these uh, areas as possible to minimize any contamination. I think if that hadn't been done, we'd be looking at a very different um, scenario here. So good work in that, James and your team. I think that's just fabulous. Um, I had a couple of questions on the do not drink notice. I noticed there was a um, statement about Bennett Creek um, being under that notice. Had a, had a separate notice gone out to the Bennett Creek area on that? Because I don't know that it was in the first one, or at least I didn't see it. Yeah, that's, uh, that's correct. Uh, those homes were all notified directly um, once, uh, uh, and what had happened is the, the Bennett uh, Springs line was made out of steel uh, going from the spring box to the tank. And over the years, that steel line had developed some leaks. And so uh, those leaks were patched with rubber patches. And uh, that main line was in uh, the direct line of fire melting those rubber patches. Um, so once that was discovered, uh, the area was played, the area served by uh, Bennett Springs only, which is uh, roughly 20 homes. Uh, they were all hand delivered notices uh, to not drink and not boil their water. Have we, uh, when do we expect testing results back in that area? So we've gotten a couple of results back uh, so far, but um, as uh, James said today, they, they replaced the pipeline. So we're gonna need to take a couple extra samples. But uh, to date we have uh, um, lab results that uh, do not uh, indicate any contamination. Yeah, so, and with that, that will have to restart the clock. Seems that we did go in there and change out a line. We're gonna have to restart the clock on the testing. The test results that came in already were clean, yes, but now it's a whole different, we have to start all over because we replaced that, that raw water service line going to that tank. It, it looks like we're, um, our testing lab has been turning things around very, very quickly. I mean, from the reports there, it looks like it is, they are doing the one day turnaround. One business day turnaround is how long does it take to get the approval through the state in order to publish these things? So yeah, the, the, just a note on our, our sample lab, they are turning out results as fast as they can. I'd say it's, it's our one day turnaround is typically turning more into about a five day turnaround. Once we collect the sample, we need to overnight it to our contract lab. Once they receive it, they analyze it. Uh, within 24 hours, um, but then it has to go through their quality control and quality assurance process. That can sometimes take uh, a little bit longer as well. And then once the data has been validated, the report is issued. Uh, once the report's issued, uh, we review it and uh, send it off to the State Water Resources Control Board Division of Drinking Water and um, you know, just kind of uh, discuss any interesting findings with them. How long does it take for them to review and approve? Uh, you know, we can uh, hear back from them within, you know, roughly a couple of hours. Yeah, so when we submitted to them on Monday with all of our information that we had compiled, it took about, it took about three hours to get confirmation, but then to put all the final hard paperwork together and everything like that, that took an additional about eight to nine hours to do so. Um, we have to adjust mapping, we have to adjust notices, we have to figure out exactly what areas and addresses. So it takes a little bit of compiling of information to be able to get that finalized and out on paper. Yeah, I know everybody was really anxious to find out about that. Hence I'm asking sort of about how long it's gonna take. 
The, uh, the last thing I want to mention to uh, Carly, I know that, you know, the west side of Highway 9 has regrettably burned pretty well, but um, we do have facilities on the east side of Highway 9 that um, did not burn. And hopefully there'll be an opportunity for us to regroup with Panorama so they can continue their fire uh, assessment of the facilities we have on the east side uh, so that we can hopefully do some better remediation of those so that if there's ever a fire on the east side, we, we will have hardened those facilities in a way that they won't um, perhaps be completely destroyed. I hope that'll be possible to do. Right, and the Panorama is still working on the comprehensive fire management plan for the entire district. Um, so those areas will be included and implementation will hopefully begin um, once we receive that plan, we move past some of this more emergency work. Great, thank you. Thank you, Bob. Did you have any other questions? Not right now. Thank you. Any other uh, questions from any director before we go to the public? Not seeing any. Okay, so let's. Uh, Director, Ferris, Director Ferris is raising his hand. Yes, we're on his screen. On the screen. <laughs> on the screen. Yeah. Okay, Lou. Thank you, President Swan. Um, Nate, I have a question for you. the The effectiveness of our chlorination system is uh, directly proportional to the turnover in our storage tank. Is there any reason to believe that the, the resident time has lengthened that might affect the lowering of the chlorine levels? Yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, that, that, that does happen. But, uh, you know, we, we try and maintain roughly about a 0.8 to a 1.0 parts per million of chlorine in our distribution, at all, distribution system at all times. Um, granted, some of the far reaches are a little bit less than that, but uh, we are collecting our uh, routine bacteriological uh, samples. Uh, and when we collect those, we're uh, required to test for chlorine as well. So um, yes, it, it, higher residence time can lower chlorine, but uh, you know, we should be well aware of just based on our routine sampling of our uh, disinfectant level that's out in our distribution system. So we have no reason to believe that that's a, a problem currently no. or in, in the near future. That's correct. Right. Thank you. And Steve, uh, yeah, I have a question or comment too. Um, yeah. I'd also like to echo what Bob said about the, the way the staff responded. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering if for Carly maybe, is are we meeting expectations of water conservation? James might be able to better answer where we are with storage. Okay. Yes, yeah, so we are doing pretty well on storage. Um, we've actually been able to turn down our main booster station coming into the upper valley um, the last few evenings. Uh, we're keeping our tanks nice and full. And again, today, like we're, we're filling those four 10,000 gallon poly tanks in the South Reservoir system. So that's pumping that's going on and that'll be going on all through the night. Tonight, we probably won't be able to turn down that booster pump station. And we're actually holding pressure and keeping people in water as up to par. Okay. And then uh, I was really glad to see the uh, water filling station. And as much as possible, I would, uh, you know, if it means buying five gallon uh, can water containers, uh, I would be in favor of that than uh, constantly using single use water bottles. So, um, that's my only suggestion there, but I, I love seeing people using uh, big containers to get water versus the single use plastic bottles. Yeah, so a lot of our residents have been bringing in their own five gallon jugs, two and a half gallon jugs and one gallon jugs. And then we had a storage of five gallon and two and a half gallon jugs down at our Johnson building from a previous tenant. And those were left behind by that tenant and they became district property at that time. And so we are now putting those out here at the fill station for people to be able to fill those and use those instead Excellent. of putting out so many plastic bottles out there. Excellent, James. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Lois, you have your 
Paul up? Muted. Muted, Lowe's. You're muted, Lowe's. <laughs> Lois, on the, the bottom of your screen, okay. there's a, oh, there you I, go. I, I see it. I got okay. it. Hi, girl. So, I, my question is, can I make a comment or can I only ask a question? You can say whatever you'd like, Lois. Okay. So, I was recently talking to the fire chief for Ziani Fire. And the night of the evacuation, when we were all being evacuated, there was a line break on Ziani School Road. And of course, all uh, the fire chief called in a report to the water district, but all the staff were being evacuated. And um, so fire chief told me he was really worried if there was a fire, what would happen? But then who showed up um, to help him out was our district manager and our manager of operations. They showed up with, with shovels and eventually more staff came. And I, I just wanted to say, we have a great staff. Um, not only that, that just happened, but they've been out there with the firefighters, making sure there's pressure on the Highway 9 corridor. They have done a phenomenal job and have put themselves at risk while doing it. And I just wanted to say thank you to all our bar staff. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you, Lois. Lois. Thank you, Lois. Here we all echo those uh, compliments and sympathies. Any other questions from the anybody on the board? I'm sorry. Now I got to look at the screen to see if Lou's waving his arm. <laughs> Let me see. I can't even find him anymore. Okay. I'll assume you're not. So let's go to the, the time for the opportunity for the public to ask questions. And uh, we've got about 24 of you out here so far. And uh, I think first up was uh, Joe Cucciera. Joe, uh, try and uh, I'd like, I'm going to limit the uh, questions to about three minutes to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to uh, ask questions and receive uh, Steve, would you like me to run a three minute? Sorry, Steve, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Would you like me to run a three to three minute timer for you? No, that's okay, Joe. I've got. I mean, uh, James, I've got a watch right here. Okay, okay, sounds good. Okay, Joe, go right ahead. Uh, would you be so kind to come back to me? I'm on a medical call, and so I can't really talk right now. Uh, no problem, Joe. Go back would, on mute, and we'll go to uh, Rob. Rob, please, oh, and also when you're asking your questions, please state your name and where you're from for the record. So just, just the town, you don't have to go any further. Sorry, I'm trying to unmute myself. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead, Rob. Rob? You are it looks like you can hear me maybe, but now I can't hear you. Let me try to ask this question if, if I'm on. Just curious about whether there's a plan to test for SVOCs in addition to VOCs, and if not, why not? Okay. Yes, yeah, so we've, uh, we've been asking our State Water Resources Control Board representatives about uh, SOCs, and uh, from the State Water Resources Control Board, uh, what they have told us is that the EPA method that we're using, EPA 524.2, it has over 84 uh, volatile organic compounds in it. Um, they've said these are the lead indicators for any contamination from fire-related impacts. Um, given the time and resources available that we have, uh, these uh, 524.2 VOCs are the most likely to show up. Hope that answers the question. 
We're, we're Thank you. I missed most of the answer because my, for some reason, my audio cut out as soon as I stopped speaking, but I appreciate the answer. Okay, I don't see any other questions there. Uh, Nate, would you like to give it a quick summary again since uh, Rob can now hear? Yeah, Rob, uh, just, uh, just to repeat, uh, so we asked the State Water Resources Control Board about uh, these SVOCs. Um, and they said that in their experience, the 524.2 uh, method uh, of uh, VOCs that we have been using to analyze for, it has over 84 compounds. Um, and they said, uh, these are the lead indicators for any contamination from fire re related impacts. Um, and given our resources and time available, the 524.2 uh, screen of VOCs are the most likely to show up uh, if there is any fire contamination. Thank you. Thank you, Nate. Okay, uh, do we have any other questions from anyone on the public? I don't see any other hands. Oh, I there we go. Uh, Logden Marion, please again state your name and where you're from and then uh, state your question or ask your question. Uh, hi, this is Bogdan. I'm uh, from Boulder Creek. Um, I was wondering, uh, Nate, if uh, or anyone else on the board, if you can recommend uh, a lab where we might be able to do our own SVOC testing if we're so inclined. Uh, yeah, I, I was in contact with uh, Eurofin's Eaton Analytical down in uh, Monrovia. Um, I believe they can do one. Um, uh, otherwise, I, I would just reach out to any uh, ELAP certified contract lab. Uh, Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Program is what that stands for. Okay. Um, just any certif environmental certified lab, um, reach out to them and see if they might be able to uh, run uh, any any tests. Well, and Nate, this is Gina, District Council. I just want to add, uh, of course, the district can't endorse any particular um, vendor. Uh, so it sounds like you have experience with that vendor, but um, we can't endorse or recommend, just to be clear. Thank you, Gina, for the clarification. Again, just uh, um, ELAP certified lab. That, that's all I would recommend. Okay, understood. Uh, do you happen to know roughly what the sort of range in cost is for such a test? And uh, I, perhaps a method, uh, uh, an EPA method that might match the sort of SVOC um, you know, screen that we're looking for? I don't. I think you would have to uh, reach out to the lab for the you know, specific tests you are looking for and they could, they could quote you on a price. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Tina, two, go. Go right ahead, Tina. I, I just wanted to answer Bogdan's question. Um, on the county website, I did find there's a list of um, labs that do water testing and it's a PDF and you kind of have to search through the um, like we fire recovery. And so I, I did research a couple of those and on that list, it tells what each lab can test for. Um, and there's a little key and it tells you like it can test for VOCs, organics, SVOCs and so forth. Um, and I don't, I don't have the, the PDF offhand, but um, if you just search for the uh, for the recovery and you look on the county website, I did find it on there. Yeah, thank you, Tina. Okay, any other uh, questions for any of the staff or any of the updates that you heard today? No. Okay. Uh, Joe, we'll give you a chance if you're if you're back off of your uh, conversation. If not, okay, we'll uh, go back here to back to our agenda. Hey, uh, if Becca, if Becca could load the second presentation, second PowerPoint. That would be great. But before we go on, uh, Steve, can I ask a, uh, another couple questions, please? Sure, Bob. Go ahead. So, Rick, um, have we are we in touch with the Cal Fire and Fire Departments regarding the firefighting strategy for um, inside the containment area? Since I think we're 
we're getting close to being fully contained. Um, there, there are still a large number of houses that survive inside the fire area. And I'm, you know, we obviously don't want to see any more houses get burned or any more pipelines get damaged that might introduce uh, VOCs into the system. Um, are, are we comfortable with the strategy for fighting these spot fires and, um, you know, flare ups that are, uh, that are occurring? You know, for the most part, from the briefings that I've attended and the briefings, uh, I won't speak for James, but the director of operations has been uh, attending daily and sometimes twice daily briefings from Cal Fire. You know, they are approaching and, and moving out and about and looking for hot spots and people are calling in. But basically, they say that this fire will not be out until we get some substantial rainfall because it is deep in a lot of stumps and, and, and hard to put out. But no matter where we go, there's still, you know, there's still some type of fire uh, burning and, and uh, they are addressing it and they've given us radio equipment so we have any issues, uh, uh, we can call directly to them and they'll come right out. But I think that, you know, the fire will not be out until we get rainfall. Well, I, I think then it sounds like we'll need to be doing uh, some continuous testing on the system just to make sure that um, we're not going to see any additional issues with VOCs or any other volatile compounds. Well, and, and Nate can speak to this better, but in talking uh, to the state uh, department, this sampling will go on for some time, um, even after we recover. And, and this, we will do this to ensure we maintain a good water quality. Uh, potable water quality. We'll be sampling for some time. How long that is, I can't tell you right now, but especially in the areas that we did get a hit of VOCs, sampling will, will continue for quite some time. And we've applied for uh, financial assistance from FEMA, and that is part of the recovery, and they will uh, cover a percentage of the sampling. Because those samples are about, uh, I think we figured just the sample itself, about $800 uh, a sample. Yeah, no, I know they're, I know they're expensive. Uh, we're we're going to continue sampling way after the fire and to ensure, uh, and we're also even starting up, uh, Nate and the uh, department are putting together a sampling schedule. We have concerns on our intake water, our raw water coming in from the fire, mm -hmm. from the, you know, Braymore subdivision, which is up on Empire grade. Uh, several homes are destroyed and that's above our headwaters. So we have quite a bit of concerns. There'll be sampling going on for quite some time. Now, Nate, do you want to add anything to that that I might have left out or got incorrect? No, just uh, just echo what you're saying, Rick, is uh, um, th that is correct. We are going to be working with the State Water Resources Control Board on a continuing uh, sample uh, um, schedule. Um, you know, I said in our Zoom meeting uh, last week that, you know, this is a marathon, it's not a sprint. So, you know, part of these, uh, you know, continued uh, samples to ensure um, that we're not seeing any contamination is, uh, you know, that, that's something we're, we're working on with our State Water Resources Control Board Regulatory Agency. Did, did we post the map today of our sample locations, Nate? Yeah, that was posted. Yes. Okay, because okay, we do have mapping. Uh, we were posting. It shows where we've been uh, taking samples in the distribution system. Yeah, and I, and I would encourage us to continue posting these samples all the way through the end of the marathon yep. so that, uh, you know, the people can be fully informed what's going on. The last question, Nate, and this may be directed more to you. Would it be worthwhile to recruit a second testing lab to be able to increase the velocity of some of the testing if we're putting in a whole bunch of tests at one time and one one lab <clears throat> excuse me can't turn them all around fast enough would it be helpful to use a second lab uh at this time i don't believe it would be uh the lab we are using they are a very large commercial laboratory i believe they're the largest uh on the west coast so um they're doing a great job uh turning samples out uh, as quickly as they can and uh you know with a, uh, a great quality control program as well so um, I, I don't believe that would uh, help us uh, to look for a second uh, lab at this time. Nate, okay. when they, when they uh, detect, don't they call us too? Do they call you when they, if they detect before they even send out sample results? They, what they do is they email preliminary results. So we do get some information 
before the final drafts come out. I mean, I mean, I think you can understand there's just a tremendous amount of concern about this that circulates yeah. out in the social media and um, uh, and in the community. And I, I just think it's going to be imperative for us to be as fast and as transparent as we can around the test results that are coming back. So thank you for continuing with that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, just to comment on that, too, is a lot of time has been spent in discussion with the State Water Resources Control Board over the last uh, seven days. So that's just been, a, um, you know, a big, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, use of time with them. So uh, we would like to post lab results as quickly as possible uh, moving forward. And, you know, uh, we appreciate everyone's patience waiting for that, too. The, the state worked over the weekend, right? The long weekend? We all did, yeah. Good. Yeah. And they, uh, they even asked us when we sent emails to follow it up with an immediate text message uh, so they knew uh, they had an email and they were, uh, okay. they were very helpful in, in crafting our message as well because they've been through this in, in other areas and other fire areas. So the state, uh, the, our two reps have really been uh, a real benefit and a real help to us uh, along with district council. Um, we've all spent a, a considerable amount of time on crafting these messages. No, that's really good. And I thank them for us for doing that. Uh, the, the community and the people will be very appreciative of that as well. Okay, thank you, Bob. Uh, Rick, do you want to proceed with your next presentation? Well, we have a second presentation if we can get Becca to uh, post it. And for this uh, presentation, District Council will deliver the presentation and it's all yours, yes. Jim. Okay, great. Thank you, Rick. Um, and uh, I, I do want to provide a couple of disclaimers. One is uh, I have been having a little bit of internet connection difficulty today. Um, I, I don't usually, so um, if I, you suddenly can't hear me, um, Please bear with me and give me a moment until my Zoom reconnects. Um, also, um, I wanted to say I, I don't hold myself out as a FEMA funding expert. I'm certainly learning a lot about this right now, and our firm has significant capabilities when it comes to federal procurement and contracting. Um, but this presentation is intended just to be a really high level. Um, overview of uh, the FEMA program, public assistance program, so that we as a group can start to get on the same page in terms of understanding how FEMA works and what the process may look like going forward. Um, and uh, of course, our uh, district manager, Rick Rogers, has a lot of experience working with FEMA over the years from the uh, Loma Prieta earthquake and uh, other disasters, which uh, no doubt will be very helpful in dealing with the mechanics of the process. And um, Rick, please do jump in anywhere uh, where you uh, have some experience to add to what we're talking about. Next slide, please. Okay, so what we're going to cover today is just some background, the governing law, the timeline that's gotten the FEMA public assistance process moving. Um, the public assistance program itself and the categories of funding that are available and what kinds of costs are eligible. And uh, in general terms, we're going to talk about the next steps going forward. Next slide, please. So the, the key statute that everyone talks about with respect to FEMA is the Stafford Act. This is federal law that allows the president um, to declare uh, an emergency or a disaster um, when an incident uh, exceeds the affected state and local government capabilities to respond. So the president um, acting on his own authority under the Stafford Act can declare a disaster that then gets the FEMA process, funding process moving. Um, next slide, please. But uh, the Stafford Act isn't the only relevant law that applies here. Um, the go uh, governors and the presidential declarations are relevant. The Stafford Act, the National Emergencies Act, California Disaster Assistance Act, 
which is the primary statute um, governing Cal OES's activities. And then of course, FEMA and Cal OES regulations are critical. Um, and then even below the various governing laws, there's a lot of guidance materials available, um, plus agreements that come into play between state and federal, um, federal and local, state and local partners, et cetera, that um, have a bearing on how the FEMA funding is actually uh, 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 distributed. Next slide. So just a, kind of the overview of the timeline that's gotten the ball moving with FEMA. Uh, August 16th, the wild, wildfire fire started. Uh, August 18th, we got the governor's proclamation of a state of emergency. August 20th, there was a FEMA agency issued fire management assistance declaration that got uh, that unlocked some emergency assistance, primarily with respect to fire fighting. Um, approximately August 21st, I don't have the exact date, the governor requested the presidential declaration of a major disaster, um, and we got that August 22nd. Um, and I understand from Rick, if this is right, the day after that, August 23rd, um, you started to have briefings on site with FEMA related to how to actually uh, implement some of the uh, funding request process. That's correct. Um, so the, oh, that took place pretty quickly. Next slide. Okay, so um, it's, the de it's the presidential declaration that we got on August 22nd that makes public assistance um, available. And just to be clear, public assistance is only one of a number of types of assistance that FEMA makes available. It's the one that's particularly relevant to government agencies and, and water agencies such as the district. Um, this type of funding is available to local governments, uh, also states, territories, et cetera, some nonprofits for certain types of emergency work and permanent repairs to damaged facilities. Um, the standard cost sharing basis for public assistance is 75% federal with 25% share being covered by state and local um, entities, unless the federal share is increased, it can go up to 90% only with presidential, uh, presidential determination of need, essentially, in shorthand terms. Next slide, please. Okay, for the administration of the PA program, um, Cal OES is the state agency that's primarily responsible for working on a public assistance grant. That's kind of the administrator of the FEMA funds. Um, it's important to note that specific funding amounts haven't yet been determined for um, the public repairs portion of um, the FEMA funding that, that the district is going to be calling upon to assist with some of the necessary repairs. Um, so we don't have specific obligations of funds yet for that purpose. Also, not all of the public assistance categories have been formally approved at this time. Um, next slide, please. And speaking of the categories, the two categories that have been approved um, for San, Santa Cruz County are the emergency work categories. That's debris removal and emergency protective measures. And um, the district has been doing some work, um, and Rick, you can speak to this better, but has been doing some work that may qualify for some reimbursement under right. these categories. Um, but next slide. We're particularly concerned about and interested in approval for the permanent um, restoration and repair categories, and in particular, category F, which applies to water utilities in the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. We have not seen formal authorization of any funds from this category for Santa County yet. Um, so it's indicated TBD there. Uh, next slide, please. If I could, if I could quick jump in yes, on please. that, Gina. Yes. I, I did receive a call today from uh, Supervisor McPherson regarding uh, Category F. Um, he was going to reach out and contact the representative, uh, Anna Ushu, and he recommended that we do the same. And it, if it, by reading my screen right, it looks like the representative is 
is on uh, is a participant in tonight's uh, meeting. Great. Um, uh, that's good to hear. Um, so now assuming that the category F funds are um, approved for the permanent repairs, um, some principles that we need to keep in mind related to cost eligibility, and this is just very le high level summary of the, of the relevant um, eligibility principles, but um, all of the costs have to be reasonable and necessary to accomplish the eligible work. Um, which is gonna be for the projects that FEMA ultimately approves through Cal OES. Um, and also the, con the procurement is gonna to have to comply with federal, state and local requirements. And um, on a prior slide where we were talking about emergency work, it, it's, it's good to note that for a true emergency like we've experienced over the past few weeks, um, compliance with local procurement policies um, may be sufficient and we've done you know what we can to try to uh, obtain board approval and write the contracts in ways that allow for that to the extent that that work ends up being um, uh, eligible for FEMA reimbursement. But um, the game kind of changes with respect to the permanent work. The, the procurement requirements become quite a, quite a bit more stringent going forward for the permanent repairs. Um, another principle to keep in mind is that the amount of the funding is going to be reduced by a, applicable credits, uh, which is kind of a shorthand for insurance and other funding sources. And of course, um, the district's, district's risk management provider, SDR, SDRMA, was notified of the incident uh, almost immediately after, you know, the wildfires became a serious issue for the district, and they will be involved um, in figuring out sort of the, the financial package for disaster recovery. Um, I, I put a note here at the bottom of the slide um, that could be a whole presentation or multiple presentations in and of itself, uh, but I just wanted to make everyone aware that improved or alternate projects may be approved, um, but depending on whether it's an improvement or an alternate project, it's going to involve uh, most likely some kind of additional local costs. Um, so again, that's just the tip of the iceberg on that issue, uh, but something to uh, be thinking about. Next slide, please. This is just a, a very high level um, overview of the process going forward. Um, there's 30 days uh, for the initial request for public assistance, which um, I imagine has already been submitted. Right. Um, then Cal OES conducts kickoff meetings, applicant briefings, and coordinates the federal, state, and local participants. And as I understand it, that's also well underway. Mm -hmm. um, and um, Cal OES also coordinates the project formulation and submission. And um, Rick, you've been right, um, right there dealing with these issues over the past few weeks. Is there anything you want to say about where this process is at. A lot of uh, what you said in your last slide about um, uh, improvements and so forth, a lot has to do with the district standard. If you have a two inch main and we have a standard that says that we will uh, put in larger mains, and as long as we've been practicing that standard, which we have, usually FEMA will approve the increase in size. Um, it, uh, it really depends on what we have for standards and that we've been following those standards in which the district has. And we have received uh, uh, improved facilities from past uh, disasters by having those standards. Great, thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, and so as we get into um, the permanent re repair phase, uh, like I said, we're going to have to be very conscientious of uh, following the applicable procurement requirements. Uh, also, the environmental review process is going to need to be completed uh, for these projects. And then um, ultimately, the state is going to be responsible for dispersing the funds, but they are federal funds that come with federal requirements for how, we, um, for how these projects are uh, completed. Next slide, please. Okay, and um, 
before we go to questions, I just wanted to, um, I, and I guess I'll pose this to Rick. Uh, we had talked about um, whether it may be necessary to ask the board tonight for authorization uh, for the board president to sign off on any letters that may be necessary to help um, move the process of obtaining approval for category F funding um, forward. Um, do you think that's still necessary or something we should try to accomplish tonight, Rick? Well, I see the representative Eshu has got her hand up, so she may have uh, quite a bit to add here on this, and maybe we could come back to this after questions. Uh, that sounds great. I'll turn it back over to the chair. Thank you, Gina. Great job. If uh, Representative Eshu has her hand up at this point, we'll go ahead and entertain any comments uh, or questions that uh, the representative has. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Brennan Robbins. I'm staff assistant for the, within the office of Congresswoman Anna Eshoo. Mm -hmm. I really just wanted to apologize. I'm listening and taking notes. I forgot I was signed in on this account. Um, Congresswoman Eshu is definitely committed to ensuring that you get all possible funding. Um, I'm taking notes so that she can help out in getting you that. And I really do apologize for the mistake. Congressman Eshu is not on the call. She's currently in a committee meeting. That's quite all right. Thank you very much for clarifying that. We'll go back to the panelists then. If the board has any questions for uh, council and uh, Director Fultz, you've got your blue paw up. Go right ahead. Bob, 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 you're uh, you got the Darth Vader mode. We can't make out anything. It's it's horrible. Uh, hang on, let's just go back to anybody else on the board that has a question for Gina. No. Lou. Lou has a question. Oh. Uh, can we get him a flag or something? Uh, I, I got to put you on my screen, Lou. Go right ahead, Lou. Lou, you're, you're muted, Lou. You're still muted, Lou. Lou's muted. How about now? Go ahead, Lou. You're, okay. you're good now. Thank you, President Swan. We, had the, we have, as a board, have approved emergency funding twice now for um, interim fixes. And I just want to make it clear to Rick, is there anything else you need from us tonight going forward that would help you in, in this disaster relief? Well, you have approved some funding and it's probably time to come back again. Uh, if you saw that uh, one of the, the slides, I've probably exceeded that and it's time to come back to the board and get more authorization. It hasn't slowed down the recovery effort. We're moving as fast as possible on procurement of materials and moving ahead. Um, so to answer your question right now, Lou, uh, the, the board has, uh, has been very supportive and it's much appreciated. Our customers have been very supportive. We're getting nothing but, but thank yous and all over the place. Um, right now we're doing good, uh, but there's a lot more to follow. And I appreciate, uh, Lou, you being chair of the engineering committee and submitting um, your thoughts on hardening the system and uh, how we need to move forward in protecting the water system from this type of disaster. Um, those are really great ideas. Is, as Lou said, is there anything we need to do tonight? To, to uh, help I don't think so, Gina. Do you believe so? No, and, and we haven't teed that up as an agenda item for tonight, but... Right. Um, we could do so in the near future if there's a need to, to get some additional authority. Mm -hmm. And just real quick, we have hired mostly local people. We have, we brought on, I don't know, James, you're still there. I don't see your picture, but we brought on uh, a lot of local people who live in the San Lorenzo Valley, local contractors, a, a local as local as possible. Uh, so that's been a really uh, a good thing for our community. Terrific. Lou, did you have any other uh, questions or comments? I think you're muted, Lou. Yeah, I'm muted again. Um, I was going to ask, since I think it was brought up, uh, Gina, that 
there may be a letter from President Swan giving authorization to proceed with certain things um, with the conduct with the, um, the with the approval of the board. Would that be something that would be helpful to have? Uh, it may be. Um, I think I, I would like to ask at the conclusion of this discussion um, for the board to authorize um, staff to work with President Swan on any request letters to our government representatives that may be necessary to try to move the process of federal FEMA uh, funding along. Um, we don't have anything to present to you tonight in part because we aren't presently certain, you know, what, you know, where we might need to uh, reach out or, you know, perhaps apply a little pressure or let our needs be known, but um, it's bound to happen over the next couple of weeks. And so if we could get that authority kind of in our, in our pocket, we could, you know, prepare a letter and get it out promptly if it becomes, um, if it starts to look like something that would be valuable. Would it be appropriate to actually make a motion now for that? I'd be willing to do that. Um, well, that would be appreciated. I did see that Director Fultz had a hand up and maybe uh, it would be good to address those comments or questions and then circle back to- yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that. That's a great idea, Lou, and, and good suggestion, but let's, let's let the rest of the uh, comments be heard first. Uh, Gina, is that, you got any other thing to follow up, Gina? Uh, nothing more from me, uh, just standing by to respond to any questions. Okay, Bob, go ahead. You're, uh, Was that better? Much better. Not sure you what know, happens with broadband sometimes. You, you, you even look mystery, better, Bob. Mystery meat broadband. Um, yeah, so Gina, thank you very much for that uh, presentation overview. I'm sure we'll learn more about the FEMA process in great detail as we go forward with this. And, probably more than we ever hoped that we would have to know. Um, I, I think this question may be directed both at you and um, Rick. My primary concern because of the large number on the preliminary budget was put together is associated with the long um, raw water pipes that are on ben, were on Ben Lomond Mountain. So those were HDPE. And so the question is whether or not we're gonna be able to make a case to replace those with something other than HDPE uh, that would be more fire resistant and be able to uh, have uh, FEMA approve that. Uh, any preliminary thoughts on that at all? And I think this probably goes in line with what Lou was saying, because he's been a great, um, shown a lot of leadership in this fire uh, protection area. Just, just real quick to Bob on that, you know, we've been up on the, on the pipeline with FEMA and a discussion, you know, they're going to look at a lot of different things and value engineering will be one. Um, I know the, there's other agencies have talked about HDE, HDPE products and, you know, they're, they're, they're citing this fire, you know, once in 70 years uh, and they're looking at types of material and, you know, is it, is it, less expensive to replace um, because we did turn it off, you know, and, and did protect the, uh, the treatment plant than it is to, you know, harden them. Or maybe we just go in and we do 150 foot, 200 foot uh, defensible space all on the pipeline. And there's, there's several things that we can do. Environmental will be huge on uh, that project just because of the amount of trees and stumps. But then again, we may be able, uh, we may have to remove many of those trees and stumps uh, that were from fire damage. So we've got a lot to, uh, to review and to look into on the replacement of that. But it is a very isolated pipeline to get uh, materials in, you know, we can fly in. But the one thing about HDPE is that it, it's a very resilient product. It, it works great for everything except fire. There's no doubt about that. But when it comes to installation and snaking through, you know, that, that heavily wooded steep forest, uh, um, there's not too many products that can do that. If you go in with steel, you'll be welding uh, fittings uh, and you'll be doing more trussles and those type of things because it just doesn't bend 
like uh, HDPE. There's going to be a lot of engineering and a lot of uh, debate over what type of material and how we reinstall that piping. But we need to get started on it. Yeah, I don't think, I mean, there's, there's certainly the possibility that another fire could go through up there. Definitely. Um, I, just because, I mean, I hate to say it, but, you know, the fire danger is not zero uh, after, even after this fire is out. I agree. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Any other uh, questions for Gina or Rick? No well, uh, President Swan. Yeah, go ahead, Rick. I don't have a question necessarily, but I just want to kind of encapsulate something that I've uh, come to have in my mind here. Um, I took my own personal tour of uh, some of the devastated area uh, above my house up Alba Road. And my heart goes, is broken for the people who have lost their homes. And whether it's FEMA or other organizations, this community is coming together to help each other. And we will do whatever it can take, whatever it's needed to help us all recover. That's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, okay, any other comments from the board? If not, we'll let the public go to the attendees. If you have any questions on Gina's presentation, uh, I see uh, I see. Joe is back with your hand up. Joe, you are recognized. Where are you from, Joe? Okay, Joe, you're on mute. Yeah, it takes a while for the uh, for the button to come up to unmute. Go right uh, ahead, Joe. Where are you from? I'm, I'm, fr I'm from Brookdale. Oh, okay, great. Um, this may have been said when I had to do this uh, medical call. Uh, so if it's been answered, I assume you're going to post the recording, and I'll I'll just hear the answer there. Are, are you going to post the recording? We we will be posting all of our recordings. Yes. Um, Go ahead and give us your question, Joe. How uh, a lot of emphasis has been is being put by the various agencies, not just on the water data, but on the issue of whether pipes were or were not depressurized in the various zones. How do we? How do you know uh, that that was fail proof? Okay, I guess we'll let the staff uh, analyze and respond to the question. I understand the question, Joe. Um, on the Highway 9 corridor, uh, we followed with CAL FIRE as much as possible. We pulled over, and uh, I mean, if I got your question right, we pulled over and discussed with CAL FIRE about the, the amount of flow and pressure out of the fire hydrants. We kept uh, some tanks with, had kept up our SCADA control. We did uh, visual checks of driving to tanks that we could get to, um, to ensure that we maintain water supply. Um, but in some areas we valved off, we valved off Bear Creek Road. Um, and that's why we had to do additional sampling out on Bear Creek Road because we know we depressurized and lost pressure on Bear Creek. But maybe, of, maybe it would help to clarify the question. I don't know. Okay, maybe maybe I, I didn't get your question correctly. What, what I understand from County Health and from State Water Resources Control Board is they are placing a lot of credence, not so much on the water data quality, as much as the reporting that they've gotten from the district about which parts of the system lost pressure and which parts remained pressured. And that was in large part why they removed the unsafe water order, they lifted it in the areas that they did. It was as much an engineering understanding 
mm -hmm. in, in, in their minds as it was a water quality uh, data analysis. And so I'm trying to understand how, it, how, how confident and how is it, what, what is the method that gives the assurance of which areas lost pressure and which didn't, and there was no cross-pollinization between the two? Well, when we sat down with the, the state, we sat down with our system mapping. Uh, we updated the mapping with arrows on the flow of water. We do know what areas stayed in water and which areas didn't stay in water by physically going out and, and checking tanks. And then that was backed up by, by water quality sampling. So it was a combination of hydraulics, which pumps were running. The main pump that brings water up from Ben Lohman uh, that's located uh, between Ben uh, Boulder Creek and Brookdale never shut off through the fire. Um, the well field never shut off. We, were, we never lost storage uh, um, uh, south of Brookdale. So we're, we were all out with eyes on the system and we're very confident that what we produced to the state to determine to lift the, the do not drink order you know, was, was good hydraulics. And we were very confident that those areas did not run out of water. And they and fire departments didn't run out of water either uh, on the Highway 9 corridor. And yes, we did turn some areas off, um, but we then we came back and after we recharged and we did several you know bacteriological sampling uh, that they were concerned about on the uh, depressurization of the system. Now the areas that have the impacted with the HDPE um, are still do not drink. And we're still sampling in those areas, right? Uh, so I don't, I don't know that answered your question, but we're very confident that are the main backbone of the water system um, stayed pressurized with good pressure, good flow. Like I say, the main pump that brings water up into the Boulder Creek area never shut down. Uh, we changed over, we removed check valves to allow a different tank to become our main storage in Boulder Creek. That tank was sampled. We're very confident on the on the uh, the lifting in the areas that we lifted um, that we maintain water pressure throughout. Because the 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 kind the responses I've been getting trying to talk to the folks that were listed uh, as contacts on the order, you know, the published names and numbers, mm -hmm. they're they're quite confident that you're going to find contamination in the areas that were depressurized and where homes were burnt. And so the question is, how do we know those, those contaminants, which they're confident they're gonna find, that there seems to be little question about that from, from the experts at, at the state and right. the county health level. How, 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 how does the district and the consumers know that there wasn't leakage into the areas that you've lifted the order in. Well, that's, and, kind of, uh, that's, that's kind of the central question. Yeah, and if, if I could jump in for a second, uh, I want to point out for Brown Act reasons that we did move on from the prior agenda item where this was relevant to a new agenda item regarding FEMA. So I'd recommend keeping any concluding discussion on this point brief. I, well, I feel that that's just an attempt to cut me off. I announced when I was called on that that I had a, a medical call I had to take. Yeah, Joe. Okay, and, hang on, Joe. Uh, let me let me. I, I think that, uh, and you may have been unbusy with your call uh, at the time, but when Nate was doing his his uh, uh, assessment of the water quality and and the and the uh, stress. Yeah, I was. It was. I, through, I was talking to a did, doctor. Yes, I w I wasn't able to listen. And I said that at the beginning, well, and I said, Joe, when if you, you don't mind, Joe, can you listen now? Joe, yeah. if you don't mind listening now, we'll let you stay on and keep talking. But uh, Nate went into a, a great detail about talking about even when water is, is made available and repressurized and added to the system, there will be an ongoing series of tests that continues uh, for quite some time. And so if you're worried about the, the, the water quality, uh, Nate's 
assurances and the state's monitoring requirements are such that there, this process will continue for quite some time. So nobody's going to turn the water on without having fully tested it and gotten sign off from the state water board. And, and just real quick, most of the system that we that we uh, lifted the, the do not drink were, were zones that were not impacted by fire. You know, there was no homes destroyed on Bear Creek Road, up on Nina Terrace. Um, those areas got low on water or ran out due to I mean, moving water around, but they weren't impacted by fire or, and had the contaminants that, uh, you know, with the, with the VOCs. So that data was looked at, and that's one of the questions the state asked, you know, were there any homes damaged here? Were there any services damaged here? And the more majority of those zones, no. The zones that have the most damage, uh, Riverside Grove, uh, Bear, uh, Big Basin, they're still a do not drink, and we're still testing. Um, we did find, you know, we did find contaminant in the Riverside Grove, and we're on top of that. We're doing uh, extreme amount of flushing right now and testing uh, in and out of that zone. Um, so we're really confident, and the state's confident, and they looked at all of our engineering mapping, and we spent probably two hours of discussion uh, to lift uh, that 20, 2,500 connections. We're very confident that uh, those, uh, that, that water is safe to drink. Yeah, the, the, you'll, you'll probably love this, Rick, but you know, the state says that, well, we're not really calling the shots. We're just providing advice and recommendations to the district and it's up to them to make the decisions. So uh, I, I thought you would really love that. I, I disagree. Okay, well, thank, thank you, Joe. We're gonna move on to another, uh, to another attendee who's been patiently waiting. Thank you, Joe, for your comments. <laughs> Uh, make sure you listen to the recording later. Uh, Bogdan, Mary, and if you have comments regarding the uh, presentation by district council, please proceed with your question or comment. Bogdan? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, great. Uh, sorry, unfortunately, I, I didn't have a specific question about the, the FEMA uh, side of the presentation, and I think actually Rick kind of touched a bit about uh, upon my question. He explained uh, that uh, Nina Terrace was out of water, so that was. Uh, if I could ask, if there aren't a lot of people in queue, uh, is it the case that you uh, sort of moved that water out of Nina Terrace, out of the sort of Fairmont area, to use elsewhere? Well, and if you pardon me for jumping in, just I just want to. We have some different folks on the phone because of the importance, I think, of some of the issues that are being discussed. And I, I do just want to remind everyone that because this is a board meeting, as opposed to the public briefing from last week, we, under the Brown Act, we do have to stay on the topic, on the agenda, which for this item was um, the FEMA assistance. So um, I, I just advise that a brief response to the question would be okay, uh, but it is going to be important for these uh, board meetings to stay on the agenda topic. Bogdan, if you want, why don't you email me and uh, we can talk tomorrow. Oh, okay, Rick, thank uh, you. Uh, and have a phone call with you. And uh, I can shortly just answer your question real quick. No, water does not move anywhere else in the system out of the Nina Terrace zone. Right. Okay. Oh, just because I, I know we are out of water after two days uh, from some folks that were uh, around. But uh, anyway, Rick, I'll, I'll shoot you an email. You call and we can talk and I can give you some reasoning for that. Okay, appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions regarding the last topic on the agenda that was discussed, the FEMA? No. Okay. Uh, that's it. We're coming to the uh, towards the end of the meeting here. Uh, Gina, did you want to allow uh, Lou to introduce that motion? Yes, uh, it would be greatly appreciated. And Lou, I can suggest language if you'd like, or um, unless you have something you want to propose. No, I, I would. I would appreciate all the help I can get. <laughs> um, Okay, so I'd propose, um, if you agree, Lou, a motion to authorize staff to work with the board president to develop any correspondence that may be uh, appropriate to communicate with the district's elected representatives. Um, 
regarding FEMA public assistance needs and for the president to sign any such correspondence on behalf of the board in the district. I so move based on Gina's comment. Thank you, Lou. I'll second that. Holly, would you like to record a vote? Director Ferris? Aye. Director Fulce? Yes. Director Henry? Muted. You're muted, Lois. I, I, I know. I, <laughs> I couldn't find it. Anyway, I, yes. Director Moran? Yes. President Swan? Yes. Motion passes. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, that wasn't too painful. I'd like to thank uh, the staff for putting together such a, again, uh, excellent and comprehensive overview of where we are. And again, to reiterate Bob's earlier comments, I really want to extend uh, uh, my appreciation and I'm sure the board and the Valley's appreciation for all the tremendous hard work that uh, staff and all of the employees of the Water District have continued to perform throughout the past uh, a uh, few weeks and unfortunately that they'll continue to do for the forthcoming foreseeable future. And uh, I'd like to thank all of the attendees uh, who showed up, including our representatives representative. And uh, I hope that you do a good job of briefing Ms. Eshu on our needs and all the help that we can gather from her. With that, uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you.